I must confess I became a little nervous when I heard that the first 15 seconds of a lecturer's appearance actually reveals his IQ. I'm a working class boy. I ask simple questions and I often get very complex answers I don't really understand. That's also the case today. I'm going to talk about why fertility apparently seems to be negatively related to brain development and to IQ. And I'm going to ask questions about what kind of mechanisms could be behind and being capable of uh, trading energy among traits. And this is the first buzzword. Energy will be a theme that will go through everything I say. So the answer to the first question, I believe, has to do with evolution. And the second has to do with mass molecular networks. Let's see if this works. Already Darwin said back in 1850 something that there must be some central mechanism that trades energy among traits. And by selective breeding we see it and also over long evolutionary times. He didn't say that it was a zero-sum game, but the body has a limited capacity, which means that if you take energy away from uh, supporting one trait, there will be less for another trait. So there will always be a price of development in certain areas. Darwin did not have any instruments for checking what the mechanisms were. So he said at least it's very <coughs> complex. It is complex in the sense of which selective factors are active. It's complex with the interactions among traits. It's complex laws that has to be applied to find out what is going on in the system. And then he added, each race had a price to pay, which suggests that if races differ, they differ in allocation of energy to different traits. So it's important when we start with this complexity to agree on what level we are on. And if we are, are act all at the all surface uh, analysis, and that's behaviorism, information theory, social learning, phenomenology, and so on, you see that there are many books on the shelves of the parents, and the kids tend to be bright. Ergo, it's because of the books. That's an example of all surface analysis. They're top-down analysis, which means you see some odd behavior, you try to find a biological explanation. Or there are bottom-up analysis where you find something, polygenic score, for example, and you try to relate it to the outcome in trait distribution. But then there is an all-bottom analysis. And already back in, well, it's almost 30 years ago, I wrote a book arguing that the level of molecules is the correct one you have to use if you want to do correct causal analysis. You're not making category errors when you're saying this is so and this is because of this. You have to stay at the same level. And I wrote a paper called Molecular Man in a Molecular World. And I choose molecules because if you go below the molecular level, you go down in quantum physics. And that's an entangled area to work in. I tried to grasp it. I couldn't and ask some very efficient people and they said, we don't understand it either. And Niels Bohr actually once said, if somebody comes and say they understand quantum mechanics, I know they don't understand it. So the problem is, how do we do physiology in the sense of looking for trait, uh, trait uh, distributions? Here I have a recent sample of a biophysical organizational framework. And the, the point is to, to follow the stream of energy throughout the system, throughout the universe, actually. And you see that the sun is producing some energy getting down to the earth. Some of it is going here to the compound level. And this means that we will see a long row of changes 
and the, the compounds here are used to use to uh, to construct cells, organs, and ecotype traits. I come to back to the term ecotype in the room. Civilization and even the uh, you could say the Gaia idea. I'm trying to encompass everything, which shows that I'm not too clever. <clears throat> the no timetable I'm using is that one of my great 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 grandfathers lived. 11,000 uh, generations ago, he had this haplotype and my mother, my great, great, great grandmother, and they lived around uh, Kenya. Then they went up and 1,900 generations ago, they reached uh, Southern Europe. Then about, uh, well, 120 uh, years ago, they reached Italy and they actually went to Bologna it was at a time of much uh, political turmoil. And then one day, one of these guys, an R1B, came to Elslu in Denmark. This is actually the dominant uh, Y haplotype frequency in this core area that Charles Morris called the, the polygon of eminence in his uh, book, uh, Human Accomplishments. Some of you might know it. So how do we analyze that? One idea is that when people started down uh, from uh, equatorial Africa, the energy level dropped. When it drops, you have to compete more for catching energy. And this idea actually made the physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, when he had read out, uh, uh, the Darwin uh, book, Origin of Species, he said, Perhaps evolution and natural selection can be put on a physical formula. He never realized that. He never did it. So how can we do that? I choose 78 countries lying between 15 degree west and 30 degree east. That includes most of Africa, except for the small islands around it, and most of northwestern Europe. And I did choose these countries. 78 in all, because there have been massive re-migrations up and down over here, and probably because Siberia can be very cold. So when the Ice Age were actively uh, concluding about 18,000 years ago, a lot of people were squeezed deep down there, and you'll find Chinese all over the fields in the, if, in the Far East. So what can we do with that? We can go back again and say, well, if energy goes down, what happens in all these areas? You can measure that. My great-grandfathers, they lived under conditions with about 65 watts per square meter reaching their soil. It fell down to 60 watts up here, and I call this ecotype far. This is ecotype five. Ecotype three lived under 50 watts, 26 watts, and we Northern Europeans lived under just about 20 watt. So there's a very clear energy gradient. It requires adaptive responses. And here you see that irradiation measured in watts per square meter. You have a low intensity here. You have high intensity here. Here you see the African countries with very high intensities. Their cranial capacity is actually quite low, and their IQs are also quite low. When you go up here in the Middle Eastern countries, higher, lower irradiations than here, and higher IQs, 80, 85, and a, a brain size between 13, 13, 20. And then you go up here in Northern Europe, that's Scandinavia and England and Germany and all that. You have IQs around 105 to 95 in Southern Europe, and you have a brain capacity that's just about 100 cubic centimeter larger when you do, do not categorize the data as I have been doing here. So what about fertility? Again, you have irradiation here, high irradiation. You have uh, high fertility. And when you go down here to the Northern countries, you have high IQs and you have lower fertility. 
So there's a clear inverse relationship between it. I'm aware that the statistics is not very well because the data are not very good. You can see a lot of dispersion around here uh, with fertility and other stuff. So what mechanism could Darwin have thought about when he said, how do we pay a tribute to one trait at the expense of another? And here you see the androgen receptor sensitivity. And here in the, uh, the end terminal, at the end of the of gene, there are some CTG, there are some CAG and CAA. And the CAG number is interesting because a low number means large transcriptional activity, which means that your sensitivity to androgen is reduced. It does not matter if you have very high or very low level of plasma testosterone if your receptor doesn't work. And clinical studies show that if it doesn't work at all, if this uh, sensitivity is reduced, you will develop as a female. You just have taller uh, stature, you have longer legs, you are more apt to be uh, uh, to be uh, uh, hired as a model, a photo model, because you have very long, elegant limbs and so on. So some of the models you see are androgen insensitive men. They have Y chromosome, they have testes, they have normal production of testosterone. It just doesn't, doesn't work. Okay, a high number of these CIG triplets means that there's less transcription. <coughs> now, if you Look at the left figure. This is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical or HP, HPA axis. There are a lot of negative and positive feedback and feed forward mechanisms in that system. So Darwin was right when he said it must be complex. The uh, echosome stressors are registered up here. <coughs> When you get stressed, there will be a lot of activity in hippocampus. A lot of chemicals will go down to the anterior pituitary and then stress hormones like cortisol will be produced here. And if you see the way of how cortisol is produced, you can have different pathways, but actually it can be studied in great details. And that's the point of the whole thing. It's not different laws as Darwin assumed, it's different pathways. But these pathways have partly been registered today. So if you get stressed, there will be activated glucose uh, in the liver and then that will be used for either fight or flight. So there are immediate reactions to stress. We know a lot of them, but could this system adapt over time as the early migrant went up from equator up north? And actually you can see here, again, we have irradiation out here. We have the African countries here. And what about the number of CIG repeats? If you go up here, you have again, all the European countries and so on. It appears that if you have a number of repeats that is increasing, you get increasingly insensitized, insensitive, it's insensitized. Can you say that? Okay, to your hormones, which means that as you go, as you go up north, you will be less sensitive even to high levels of testosterone. <clears throat> now, if you look at the number of CAD repeats, they are about 21, 22 to 24 in the African countries. But if you look at the whole, then it goes up. But you can see that these measures are not very good. They are dispersed all over. And Lee Ellis, my good friend, who actually uh, did the counting and so on, and then I put them into the echosomes I talked about, he said, they are lousy, but that's the best we have. So I won't defend if somebody say, ah, you can't work on that. I would tend to agree with you on that. So if we want to quantify all these processes going on, and that's my final uh, goal, 
then we have to undergird this system with some kind of uh, mathematics. It's phenomenology all the way here, as is Darwin's theory of evolution. It's a phenomenological theory. And Darwin actually regretted that he did not attain the mathematical proficiency. And he said, I think people who has that has gained a sixth sense. So he was aware that he didn't know about that. What can we do about that? Well, we can underlay this uh, biophysical uh, system with graph mathematics. And mathematically, we can actually reconstruct the, the topology and the chemistry behind the a radiation procedure, production of sugar from sugar, uh, of sugar from CO2 in the atmosphere and water in the ground. So we can measure this irradiation in rats, as I said. It can be transformed to carbohydrate. You can capture in competition with others in your ecozone. And then each branch in the graph represents the conversion compound of I to J. And you have to operate with some variables in this system, where S is the amount of entropy loss in the system. My is the free energy of compound I. T is the temperature of the network system, and temperature is extremely important to keep track of. N is the amount, and S is the number of compounds. The delta S minus one you see represents the chemical rate parameter for the conversion from compound I to J, a monotonous, a monotonous increasing functions of my I minus my J. And the reactions is the system is actually driven by the difference in chemical potential among the stuffs in this system. Now, this is the fourth graph. There are several graphs. I skipped some of them. It accounts mathematically for the differential allocation of irradiation among organs serving reproductive and cognitive traits during the prehistoric migration. And you have to realize that compartmentalization is essential here because some people say, oh, there are so many molecules and energy floating around in the system that it's hard to keep track of the topology and the separateness of the things. You can actually have some nodes here which uh, can be a capacitor of some kind, some energy, and then you have a gradient down here where one, one organ is uh, redistributed energy wise to another organ and so on. And so the whole system is connected, but you can actually by this net, uh, this graph uh, mathematics, you can pin down each of the compounds and what they do to other compounds, which means the redistribution of energy in the whole system. Irradiation also fuels civil behavior, and now comes one of my wilder assumptions. Through competitive eating, if you are eating well and you are stealing the food from somebody else, you will be a success. You will have optimized adaptation at the individual level as you go from equator and up. The reproduction of energy goes through uh, optimized offspring and improved collective mining you can do uh, fossil, you can derive energy from fossil from industrialization processes and so on. So actually, this is a, in an in energy distribution system that also goes to explain differences in civilizations by optimization of individuals and the way they can derive further energy. So I think covariant factor analysis across these many different compartments might actually derive a C factor with any desired degree of precision. Uh, I think I'll skip that one because it was a very primitive thing I thought out many, many years ago. When the climate is warm, you have limited brain size evolution, high plasma testosterone and high sensitivity for it. And that means that high T nexus trait will prevail. The system will be uh, filled with corruption and crime. And uh, the 
life and chances are, uh, uh, depends on opt opt uh, opportunism and its high fertility and the uh, the opposite pattern was there. I think that's what I'm trying to reproduce in more terms today, more precise terms. So, I I will finish here by looking at some of the correlations of the CID repeat number and a number of traits, and they're positive correlations. The more CID repeats you have, that's about 20, 22 or so on, correlates with high IQ, with the median age, with the human development index, one measure it, with mother's mean age at first birth, lower fertility, DNA haplotype frequency, ADSP. ADSP has been shown to correlate positively with IQ, uh, with how many doctors are around, with another measure of development, with life expectancy, people up north live longer than down south, and so on. Well, it might change. Body height, they were taller, they have longer school education, they ranked higher on democracy, larger capacity of the brain, they earned more money, they had more a higher body mass index, so on. The genetic distance from Kenya increased. Global gender gap reports also show that there are larger sex differences up north than south. I think I would agree with that. And we use more electricity, but we also have a higher neuroticism rate uh, reflected in a higher suicide rate. Note that migration or longitudinal residence does not correlate with differences in irradiation, neither as any need to adapt to differences, so it is not, <coughs> it is not significantly related. But criminality, homicide rate, violent crime, PC fertility, traffic deaths and so on, many bad things actually is correlated with this uh, measure of how many CAG repeats you have. <clears throat> so, in some, <clears throat> I think that perhaps the thermodynamic non-equilibrium modeling might solve Darwin's problem with trading energy among traits during ontogeny and phylogeny at the level where all variables enjoy equal causal understanding, a point I think is very important. Perhaps the application of graph mathematics might help us to unravel the topology of the system of complexity. And perhaps the introduction of empirically defined ecotypes, long-term adapted to stressors in their respective ecosomes, might replace the outdated concept of race. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, if you change the number, your sensitivity to testosterone will change. And as you know, testosterone is correlated with a number of things, for example, criminality and so on. Then if you had more, added more, edited more to it, there will be less crime on this average uh, idea. But I don't know if you really can do it, but perhaps that will be possible one day. There are certain animals that fit the pattern, but the problem is if you look, for example, at birds, then some birds are going very far away, and that means that they have to be very light in order to endure this way. So you have to look at birds standing in each position, but different arts are differently distributed in different climates. So there are problems with that. But I think Emil looked at it a long time ago, and he found that there were some analogs. I don't know because we don't have the data for it. I would guess it would be so. And I hope that Lee Ellis will look into that matter. It's important. And Northeast Asians would have uh, more and be less sensitive to testosterone. But it's a guess.
I think they're brain death. No. <laughs>